another uh, thread here um, of my, my great love for anything Spanish. And then later, of course, Hispanic, Afro-Cuban, Puerto Rican, all of this stuff. Um, somehow when I was a kid, my mom would take me to the museum because uh, we, we grew up a very uh, artistic family. My dad was a singer. My mom, uh, my grandfather uh, and uncle had an auction gallery. And uh, my, my grandfather uh, taught my mom everything about art when, from the time she was a little girl. Take her to museums. Look at this. This is that and this is that. Because he knew everything. Mm. Amazing, like a savant. Um, I think he had an eighth grade education. He was kind of a genius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. And uh, so I grew up in a house full of art, a very modest house, but full of all this stuff from the auction gallery mm. that he had given to my mom as presents over the years, art from all over the world. And I always loved the Spanish stuff and the El Greco paintings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I was just drawn to them. And when I went to music school uh, from age 9 to 12, uh, Manhattan School of Music, uh, it was in Spanish Harlem. And I might have heard stuff coming out of people's apartments. I kind of remember this. But whatever the reason, I started improvising when I was 8 or 9 years old. And I just improvised this habanero one day. And it went kind of... Anyway, it goes on, but I don't know what led a 10 or 11 year old Jewish boy from Rockway Beach to write a habanera, but <laughs> like I said, I, I loved Spanish stuff. I probably heard things coming out of the apartments across the street from the music school. I, they had little you know, clo uh, uh, food, food shops there that had little speakers outside them, probably you know, playing salsa music. You know, I didn't know what it was at the time, mm. but uh, it led me to write this piece that I called Spanish Serenade. And the funny thing is, I forgot that I wrote it until I was about 21. I, I didn't play it after I was 11 or so. Mm. And the, um, the ragtime piano craze had started because of that movie, The Sting. Mm. And Marvin Hamlish had arranged all of Scott Joplin's music uh, for this movie because it was public domain at that time, a very sly guy. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, he, th this music was sweeping the country, and so I got some Scott Joplin things and, uh, you know, play the, you know, was playing all these ragtime things, and, you know, one day I sat down and I st uh, started playing this. I thought, which Scott Joplin tune is it? Because he wrote some <laughs> habaneras and some tangos. I can't remember the, the names of them. There's one called Solace that sort of sounds like that. And I went, wait a minute. I wrote that. <laughs> oh, and, and it all came back to me mm. as I sat there and practiced it. And then the, the continuation of the story, there's a lot of details, but about 30 years later, no, 25 years later, I realized as I learned more about music that it was only the first part of a much longer piece. Mm. And so I wrote a B section in the relative minor, and then I wrote a C section and the key of the fourth, like the rondo form. Mm. And uh, then I added a little mambo section uh, because I was playing in, in a Latin jazz band at the time and played this thing for my friend Ruben Alvarez, the timbales player, and he said, man, you should put a little mambo in there in, there in the middle, you know, for timbale solo, like danzon music from Cuba. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So I did that. <laughs> and uh, so the piece came into its full fruition and it's called Spanish Serenade.
<laughs> Thank you. So where did you finish composing that? Oh, you know, I, I still work on little things about it, but uh, 1996, kind of, I came up with most of those ideas, but then I added some stuff in around 2013, maybe. Oh, wow. Um, you know, when you play a piece a lot, you, you just you just keep changing it if you have to play it a lot of times. Like if you listen to Duke Ellington's arrangements of his own tunes, they mm -hmm. changed over the years mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like a solo. You know, you play solos on a t piece, they're always different. So you, you sort of write your soloistic impulses into the arrangements, you mm. know, like the, the, the left hand counterpoint, this stuff. Uh, that stuff came much later. I just said, oh, it should be something more interesting there. You know? <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, some of the other stuff too. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's very much a, like a period piece, like, like late 19th century, like through the 1920s maybe or something. That, and I ended up playing it one time with uh, the great uh, Cuban drummer Ignacio Berroa, mm. who uh, I used to play with him with Paquito de Rivera. That's another story, another part of my life. Um, and Ignacio's father had a band that played this music. He grew up playing drums in this, and he heard it, and he said, oh, Howard, man, this sounds exactly like what I grew up playing in Cuba. He said, this is unbelievable that you wrote this. <laughs> it's like I put myself back into another time, and when we played it together, I didn't have to say a thing to him, man. He, wow. <laughs> it was so beautiful. I played mm. it with, uh, I did an arrangement for uh, trumpet and tenor and uh, piano, bass, and drums. Uh, we, we played at the uh, weekend at the Green Mill in Chicago, and we did this tune, and uh, yeah, people really flipped out. It was uh, the best I've probably ever, uh, the most true version of it ever. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Well, it's, mm. it's been stuck in my head ever since you showed it to me a few, a few days ago. We were prepping uh, for this. It's, it's, it's a beautiful melody. And Thank uh, you. Yeah. I was just wondering, do you mind touching a little bit? You explained to me the other day about, because uh, you spoke about, you know, the, the Spanish influence in your life, but um, it's a big Spanish tradition of Jewish people in Spain. Do you mind kind of touching on that? Yeah, this is something that, you know, the Jewish people have been around for so long. We've been around for a while, you know, <laughs> even longer than the Chinese, which leads me leads to the question: like, what did the Jews do in those first few thousand years? What did they do for food? You know. Mm. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <Doom>. <laughs> so, you know, our history has so many twists and turns in it, like the plant. You know. Mm. Uh, and it turns out, you know, you read about this stuff in uh, Jonah, you know, he's going to Tarshish, and that, they think that was Spain. And uh, so Jews had been aware of Spain for a long time. It's the end of the Mediterranean, and if you go past it, you go through the Pillars of Hercules and fall off the end of the earth. <laughs> um, but gradually, there became a, an extremely large Jewish population in Spain and uh, with a very complicated history of conflicts and and peace with the uh, the Christian uh, and Muslim uh, people who are controlling these different regions of Spain. Uh, and in the south of Spain, the Jews were really felt at home for a long time. Uh, and there was a, a golden age where Jews and Muslims and Christians all interacted there in like Sevilla and Cordoba and these places. Um, and uh, the Spanish government, when they had the Inquisition, uh, they, the, the culmination of the Inquisition was the expulsion of all the Jews. And uh, I don't have to go into detail about the Inquisition. People can look it up in history books. But the Jews were expelled from Spain in spite of all the efforts of the last Jewish prime minister of Spain, whose name was uh, Abravanel. Mm. Uh, he was born in Portugal. He was extremely wealthy. He even offered his personal fortune to the crown in exchange for letting the Jews stay, and they said no. Wow. And the reason why I know the date of the expulsion is that I met one of his descendants, great, 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 great grandchild of Abravanel, who told me this. He was, I was buying something, and he was my salesman. I said, man, you're such a nice person that's such an unusual name uh, what what is it from you know and he told me and I went wow he's I'm a direct descendant of the Lord last Jewish Prime Minister of Spain I said really wow uh, <laughs> and he said yes every year 
we celebrate the expulsion, the date of the expulsion as a day of mourning. Mm. And I said, oh, what was that date? And I'll never forget it because it's my birthday. Um, <laughs> ah. July 31st, 1492, oh. which is why Columbus sailed the ocean blue the next day because uh, all Jews were expelled from Spain and he had Jewish crew members and he had a split. Mm. Wow. So uh, on my first visit to Spain, I was playing there with a Lebanese oud player named Rabi Abu Khalil. And uh, we were a very wild band with a French tuba player, a American, a Lebanese American drummer, uh, and a Syrian percussionist. And me on harmonica, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what else would you play in a band with these instruments, you know? <laughs> um, and so uh, we were playing all around Sevilla. Um, and our driver said, there's a place you should see. I said, okay, uh, take us there. It was a day off or, or it was like before the concert or something. And he started driving us to this place. And I started feeling really excited. I don't know why. This feeling overcame me. And I'm looking at the fields and I said, you know, in, uh, in Spanish, which I know a little bit, is like, al coton, that's cotton. He said, si, sí, al coton. It's like I knew what was growing in the fields even though the plants had been cut down. Mm -hmm. It was really strange thing. Mm. And I got to this town, and he said, and he started driving up this hill to this parador, which is an inn that was created out of a historical building, a castle. And he said, you should look at the view from there. And I went up there. And it was like someone hit me over the head. I had imagined this sitting in the cafeteria at the Manhattan School of Music when I was 11 years old. <laughs> and I tried to write it down like I called it, um, like, oh, geez, what did I call it? Castle in Spain or something like that. I can't remember anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a daydream that I had about this place. I totally forgot about it. I never once thought about it. I just tried to write down a melody, you know, when I was 11 or something. Until this happened when I was 45 or something. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like, this is what I saw in my mind when I was a kid. And I had never once thought about it. It, it just went, boom. Mm. And I don't understand it. I've never had that experience traveling anywhere else in the world. But there was something about being there that was really heavy. And then also being in the cathedral in Sevilla, I had a very strong feeling of dread when mm. they said, oh, this is the room where Torquemada used to sentence people to death. And I walked in there and I started like sweating Oof. and I had to run out of the room. Wow. I mean, I, I visit churches all over the world. I mean, I, I like visiting museums, churches, palaces. I've never felt like this anywhere. Mm. And so I don't, I'm not sure if I can really play this or not, but um, I wrote a tune based on my experience in this town of Carmona mm. and I call it Carmona and it's on the uh, second Trio Globo album, which is called uh, Carnival of Souls. Mm. So I'm going to try to play it. Yeah. <laughs>
So that was the feeling that had overcome me in the car. I was starting to play like Spanish flamenco guitar stuff, you know. You know, uh, and also I had, you know, a good friend here in Evanston who was a guitar maker and a flamenco guitarist, and I was super drawn to that music too. So mm. my whole life, I, I learned a lot about flamenco, all the different forms, alegrias, bulerias, and uh, soleares, and uh, tarantas, and all this stuff. I know a lot about this stuff. So the, uh, always was drawn to th Spanish things. And then later, of course, the Afro-Cuban stuff, which is what's next. We hope you enjoyed today's episode and hope that you'll join us back here next week. As a nonprofit, we can only afford to put on great programming like this thanks to your support. Please visit naranaarts.org for more information and to learn how to get involved.